a history guy. I have a degree in history and I love history. And if you love history too, this is the channel for you. Between November of 1922 and February of 1923, something truly historic occurred. Representatives of nine nations, the world's largest naval powers, met in Washington, D.C. to discuss the proliferation of weapons of war. It was the first major international conference held in the United States, and the first international arms control conference in history. The Washington Naval Conference is little remembered today, but it was a seminal moment in U.S. diplomatic history, a major driver of policy in the period between the World Wars, and in the end, a failure. And the reasons for all of the above make it history that deserves to be remembered. There were many drivers for the Washington Naval Conference and the treaties that followed, but the simplest driver was that following World War I, major powers engaged in a naval arms race that was rather expensive. Despite being allies in the First World War, the nations that were most affected were the United States, its Pacific rival Japan, and the greatest naval power at the time, Great Britain. The United States had finished the Great War as the world's leading industrial power and with the world's second largest navy. Realizing that naval power would give the U.S. a substantial ability to enforce his vision for world alignment and wary of the threat that Japanese militarism would offer to U.S. interests in the Pacific, President Woodrow Wilson had announced an ambitious program to expand and modernize the American fleet. But the U.S. public was wary of wars and opposed the huge costs of naval construction, and the population was moving back towards its isolationist tendencies. The new Republican Harding administration wanted an agreement to limit the new arms race. Japan was rediscovering its position as one of the world's great powers and ambitiously building new, modern battleships and battle cruisers. But their industrial capacity was limited, and at least some of their leadership knew that they could not succeed in an all-out arms race. Despite their ambitions, in 1922, the Japanese had only 55% as many capital ships as the Americans, and just 18% of the GDP. Great Britain had, numerically, the largest navy in the world, but the fleet was aging and unable to compete with more modern American and Japanese ships. They had plans to produce more modern vessels, but the war and the cost of building the fleet they already had had almost bankrupted the nation. And so despite their ambitions, the major powers all had reason to try to prevent an arms race. And despite Republican opposition to internationalism, when President Harding heard that Great Britain was planning on holding a conference, he took the initiative. Great Britain, Japan, France, and Italy were invited to discuss the reduction of naval capacity, while Belgium, China, the Netherlands, and Portugal were also included to discuss the situation in the Far East. At the first session, held November 21st, 1921, U.S. Secretary of State Charles Evans Hughes provided a dramatic beginning for the conference by stating with resolve, the way to disarm is to disarm. The conference resulted in three major treaties and several bilateral treaties, which were ratified in August of 1943. The most significant was the Five Power Treaty, which placed a 10-year moratorium on building capital ships, battleships, and battle cruisers, limited the total amount of capital ship tonnage each nation could have based on ship displacement, with the U.S. and Britain each allowed 500,000 tons, Japan 300,000 tons, and France and Italy each 175,000 tons. The U.S. and Britain were allowed more tonnage because they were expected to maintain fleets in both the Atlantic and the Pacific. The nations could not come up with a similar agreement regarding total allowed tonnage of smaller vessels, but did limit the allowed size of such vessels. Although there were discussions of limits on submarines, no agreement was reached. To allay Japanese concerns, current bases in the Pacific were recognized, but nations were not allowed to grow or reinforce those bases. Another treaty ended the British-Japanese alliance and instead committed the U.S., Japan, Britain, and France to hold negotiations before military action in the case of a crisis in the Far East. And finally, all nine conference participants agreed to the U.S. goal of an open China policy, agreeing to respect Chinese territorial integrity, while China, in return, agreed not to discriminate against any country seeking to do business there. The treaties did end a period of battleship construction, and several existing ships or ships under construction were scrapped or converted into aircraft carriers, which were unregulated. The Japanese battlecruiser Akagi, then under construction, for example, was one of those converted to an aircraft carrier. It was then one of the six carriers used in the attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7th of 1941, and then sunk at the Battle of Midway in 1942. But in the end, we know the treaty failed to prevent both a naval arms race and a Second World War. 
Why? First, the treaty only placed limits on some classes of ships, leading to an arms race in unregulated classes. There was a significant race to build so-called treaty cruisers, for example, that met the size limitations of the treaty, 10,000 ton displacement and 8 inch guns. Further treaties in London in 1930 and 1936 placed limits on smaller classes of ships, although Japan and Italy did not sign the 1936 agreement. Second, the conference focused on battleships, which many argue had already become obsolete. While nations did eventually start building new battleships, their limited use in naval warfare in the Second World War demonstrated that the treaty had focused in the wrong place. Third, because of national security concerns, there was a lack of verification. Nations simply cheated, using creative computations of tonnage, designing ships where the treaty limited guns could be easily replaced with larger guns in times of war, or simply lying. The Japanese Mogami class of cruiser, for example, was a full 20% larger than the treaty allowance. Fourth, the Japanese Naval Command was never satisfied with the treaty and felt that their smaller allotment was disrespectful. The resentment eventually led Japan to renounce the treaty, sparking another naval arms race. One reason? The United States was spying on all the other participants in the Washington Naval Conference, which gave them a substantial advantage in the negotiations. Fully aware of all Japanese diplomatic communications, the U.S. was able to get them to agree to the lowest possible number that they would be willing to accept. Finally, the Pacific Agreements, while intended to maintain the status quo, offered Japan an advantage in the early part of World War II. The U.S. inability to reinforce Wake Island, Guam, and the Philippines invited, some think, Japanese attack, and certainly impacted early war strategy and early U.S. losses in the war. So would the world have been better off without the world's first arms limitation treaty? The treaty lulled the U.S. into a false sense of security that allowed Japan to build a fleet that could test with the United States in the Pacific, and that made war more rather than less likely. As the treaty did not accurately represent the disparity in industrial capacity between the two, it certainly disadvantaged the United States in the early part of the Second World War. And while it would be unfair to say that the Washington Naval Treaty caused the Second World War, some certainly argue that it pretty much invited Japan to attack Pearl Harbor and was the primary reason that Japan was able to score early victories in the Pacific. It also ended up disadvantaging Great Britain. The original calculation assumed that the French fleet would counterbalance the Italian fleet in the Mediterranean. But when the French were forced to capitulate early in the war, that meant that the limited British fleet had to deal with both the Germans in the Atlantic and the Italians in the Mediterranean. One of its most interesting impacts was the way that it changed fleet composition in the Second World War. The Washington Naval Treaty drove the development of naval aviation, which became a primary weapon of naval combat in the Second World War. While it certainly had its flaws, the treaty and the compromises that it negotiated are still studied as a model for arms reduction through diplomacy. And of course, an unrestricted naval arms race in the 1920s and 30s might have made the world a more unstable place and certainly would have had significant economic impacts. In the end, the best that can be said is that the Washington Naval Treaty was the best that could be accomplished at the time, and it paved the way for future arms limitation talks like the strategic arms limitation talks. It changed the way that nations interact with each other. And for that reason alone, it is history that deserves to be remembered. I'm the History Guy, and I hope you enjoyed this edition of my series, Five Minutes of History, short snippets of forgotten history, five to ten minutes long. And if you did enjoy, all you have to do is click that thumbs up button, which is there on the left. If you have any questions or comments, all you need to do is write those in the comment section, and I will be happy to respond. And if you'd like five minutes more of forgotten history, all you need to do is subscribe.